Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everyone, I am Dr. Rose, Assistant Professor, Department of Anatomy, Government Medical College, Trishu. So, in this session, we will be see, seeing about the development of gut tubes. Before moving on to the topic proper, let us see a clinical scenario. This baby is born with a huge mass at the umbilical region and this condition is known as omphalocele. Omphalocele means you have the gut tubes lying outside the abdominal cavity and this is covered by amnion. Usually this condition is associated with cardiac and neural tube defects. And in this condition, you will also get elevated alpha fetoprotein levels. These conditions can be actually prenatally diagnosed because these children will be always suffering from chromosomal abnormalities as well. So, if diagnosed early, you can intervene early. So, we will move on to the topic proper. In this session, we will be dealing with the formation of the primitive gut tube, the derivatives of the gut tubes, the arterial supply, how the rotation happens and how the organs are coming to the adult position, the fixation of the gut, the development of mesenteries which are suspending these gut tubes, the development of the body cavities and a little bit of applied aspect. So, first we will see the formation of the primitive gut tube. This is actually a coronal section where you can see the amniotic cavity in the upper aspect and you can see the yolk sac in the lower aspect. So, in the upper aspect we have the ectoderm and in the lower aspect you have the endoderm. Now, what is going to happen is this yolk sac is going to get incorporated into the embryonic disc to form the primitive gut. So, we have a large amniotic cavity in the upper part and a small yolk sac cavity in the lower part. As the uh, amniotic cavity enlarges, it will just take off some of the yolk sac into the embryonic disc and this part of the yolk sac which is getting incorporated into the embryonic disc, you call it as primitive gut. So, the formation of primitive gut is by the absorption of a part of the yolk sac into the embryonic disc. Now, the primitive gut is giving rise to the gut tubes as well as to the respiratory system. So, primitive gut is a precursor of both respiratory and digestive system. The epithelial lining of the gut is actually endodermal in origin because yolk sac is having an endodermal lining. So, the epithelial lining of the gut tube will also be having endodermal in origin except at the two ends. These are the two ends. This is the future mouth and this is the future anal canal. So, at these regions you will not be getting an endodermal lining but you will be getting an ectodermal lining. But throughout the rest of the gut tube you will be getting an endodermal lining since the yolk sac is previously lined by the endoderm. Now, at the cephalic region, you can see that the primitive gut actually forms a blind end which is actually in communication with the yolk sac. Okay. So, cephalic region, the primitive gut forms a blind ending tube which is a cranial end and it is in communication with the yolk sac. This part is known as the foregut. So, the primitive gut extends from the oral cavity to the anal canal. The cephalic end of this region is known as the foregut. Now, what do you call the caudal region? The caudal region that is again a blind ending tube, this is known as the hindgut. This is caudal to the communication with the yolk sac. This can be considered as the communication with the yolk sac. You, you have the remaining part of the yolk sac here. So, the yolk sac is still communicating with the primitive gut. So, Cranial to this communication, you call it as foregut and caudal to this communication, you call it as hindgut. And both these tubes are blind ending tubes in the initial period. Now, the ventral aspect of the hindgut, you will get an elongation. 
that is known as the allantoic diverticulum. So, this allantoic diverticulum will be actually pointing towards the umbilical cord because this is meant to vascularize the umbilical cord. That means the umbilical vessels are derived from the vessels of the allantoic diverticulum. Now, what do you mean by the hindgut? Towards the lower aspect that is caudal to the communication, you have the hindgut and what do you mean by cloaca then? That is the caudal most end of the hindgut. So, this hindgut you have a caudal most pouching just caudal to the allantoic diverticulum and that is known as cloaca. Now, what is the fate of cloaca? Why you want cloaca? This cloaca is actually dividing into a ventral portion and a dorsal portion. The ventral portion is actually known as primitive urogenital sinus. Primitive urogenital sinus means it is giving rise to the urogenital system. Now, dorsally it is known as the primitive rectum. Primitive rectum means it is from this part of the primitive rectum you get the formation of the rectum and anal canal. And is there any separation or is there any barrier between this primitive urogenital sinus and primitive rectum? Yes, the cloaca first was a single pouch which got separated by the formation of a urorectal septum. So, this urorectal septum will be directly coming into the cloaca and it will divide the cloaca into a ventral or anterior primitive urogenital sinus which will be giving rise to urogenital system and a dorsal portion that is known as the primitive rectum which is giving rise to the rectum and anal canal. So, this is just a rough idea about the urorectal septum which divides the entire cloaca into a ventral primitive urogenital sinus and a dorsal primitive rectum. So, this is a better view of the cloaca. You can see the cloaca is ending at the proctorium which will be opening to form the anal canal portion. This is the allantois and this entire thing is known as the cloaca. You can see a septum coming down. This septum is known as urorectal septum and that will be dividing the cloaca into a posterior or dorsal primitive rectum and an anterior or ventral primitive urogenital sinus and this is actually how the structures are derived. So, from the primitive rectum we have already mentioned that we have the rectum and anal canal formed and from the primitive urogenital sinus you have the bladder formed. Now, the urorectal septum actually fuses with the cloacal membrane. The urorectal septum we have already seen that it was coming from above and as it comes down and down it fuses with the cloacal membrane so that the cloacal membrane is divided into two. Ventrally you call it as urogenital membrane and dorsally you call it as anal membrane. So, you have a ventral urogenital membrane and a dorsal anal membrane. So, why you want this urogenital membrane and you the anal membrane? These two membranes will be getting perforated in order to make communication with the exterior in future. That is the anal orifice and the urogenital orifices will be formed by the perforation of the urogenital membrane and the anal membrane. Now, we just mentioned about the foregut which is actually cranial to the communication of the primitive gut with the yolk sac and the hindgut caudal to the communication between the primitive gut and the yolk sac. Now, what do you mean by midgut? Midgut is actually the part of the primitive gut which is communicating with the yolk sac. This region is known as the midgut. Now, you can see the communicating link between the primitive gut and the yolk sac. What do you call this communication? This is known as the vitello intestinal duct. It has got two other names as well. The other one is vitelline duct and it is also known as omphalomesentric duct. So, these are the different names given to the communication between the midgut and the yolk sac. Now, we will see what is happening to the midgut. The midgut actually was a straight tube in the beginning. Later, it is actually getting looped and it is becoming tubular and it is forming a loop you have the superior mesenteric artery. The superior mesenteric artery is actually having uh, or it is actually forming an axis for this midgut loop. 
So, by the formation of the superior mesenteric artery, this loop is actually divided into two segments. The segment which is lying cranially that is known as the proximal segment and the segment which is lying caudally that is known as the distal segment. So, the superior mesenteric artery forms an axis through the loop of the midgut and the segment which is lying cranially you call it as the proximal segment and the segment which is lying caudally you call it as the distal segment. Now at this point you will get a cecal bud and that cecal bud will be actually formed in the distal segment of the midgut. That is the important cecal segment will be cecal bud will be actually formed in the distal segment of the midgut. Now the vital intestinal duct will be actually passing through the umbilical opening. Cranial end the foregut is actually separated from the stomodium. We have already mentioned that uh, the cranial part is actually a blind ending tube. So, this is actually separated from the stomodium or future mouth by a membrane that is known as the buccopharyngeal membrane. So, this buccopharyngeal membrane initially it is closing the communication between the stomodium and the primitive gut. But later what happens is this will get perforated and the communication will begin from the exterior into the primitive gut. So, this is the buccopharyngeal membrane. Similarly, caudally when you look Again, we have mentioned that the hindgut is ending as a blind loop. So, this is actually the there is a separation between the proctodium and the hindgut. This separating membrane is known as the cloacal membrane. So, cranially you have the buccopharyngeal membrane and caudally you have the cloacal membrane. These two membranes will be getting perforated so that a communication is maintained between the primitive gut and the exterior. Now let us see the derivatives of each part. We have mentioned about the primitive gut, we have mentioned about the derivatives, the main derivatives like the foregut, the midgut and hindgut. Now we will see individually what are the structures derived from the foregut, structures derived from the midgut and structures derived from the hindgut. So first we will see the derivatives of foregut. So it starts with the floor of mouth including the tongue, you have the pharynx, you have the derivatives of the pharyngeal pouches and the thyroid then esophagus, then stomach, then duodenum. So, duodenum the entire thing is not uh, actually derived from the foregut, it is only up to the upper half of the second part. So, the duodenum, the entire duodenum only the upper part of the second part is actually derived from the foregut. The remaining part of the duodenum, the lower part of the second part as well as the third and fourth part, the remaining is derived from the midgut. That point you have to keep in mind. Then you have the liver and the extrahepatic biliary system, the pancreas, the respiratory system. So, all these are actually the derivatives of the foregut. Now, the duodenum, the second part distilled to the major papillae. That means the third part and the fourth part. This is the uh, second part where you get the opening of the major papillae. So, the part which is distal to this papilla, then you have the jejunum, the coils of the jejunum, then you have the coils of ileum, then you have the cecum and appendix, then you have the ascending colon. Here it is actually in the process of development. So, once it completes the rotation and everything, this part will come down actually. So, the cecum, the appendix, the ascending colon and the junction, the right two-third of the transverse colon till the junction of right two-third and left one-third. Up to this point, you get it as midgut or these are the derivatives of midgut. So, starting from the second part of duodenum that is the opening of the major duodenal papillae till the junction of right two-third and left one-third of the transverse colon, all these are derived from the midgut. Now, what are the structures derived from the hindgut? So, the remaining part that is the left one third of the transverse colon, the descending colon, the pelvic colon, then you have the rectum and upper part of anal canal. Along with this, you have the urogenital system also derived from the primitive urogenital sinus that is actually a part of cloaca. So, that is also uh, a derivative of the hindgut. So, these are the structures derived from the hindgut. Now, let us see about the arterial supply. Each foregut, midgut and hindgut are having its own arterial supply. So, what are the arterial supply? 
to the foregut, midgut and hindgut. Let's see. So the major branches to all these guts are actually coming from the abdominal iota. So the first artery is known as the celiac artery. So celiac artery is actually supplying the lower part of esophagus up to the middle of the second part of duodenum because that is the limit of the foregut, right? So starting from the lower part of esophagus, the entire stomach, the first part of duodenum, the second part up to the opening of the major duodenal papilla, you get the blood supply from the celiac artery. Now what about the blood supply of midgut? you will get the blood supply to the midgut from the superior mesenteric artery. This entire thing you can call it as the abdominal aorta. You can see the three main branches arising from the abdominal aorta. The first one was the celiac artery, the second one was the superior mesenteric artery and the third one is the inferior mesenteric artery. So the midgut is actually getting the blood supply from the superior mesenteric artery. So, what are the regions supplied by the superior mesenteric artery? It will be the same as that of the midgut derivatives. So, let us see. So, it starts from the second part of duodenum, from the almost the middle of the second part of duodenum to the junction of right two-third and left one-third of the transverse column. So, that is the region which is supplied by the superior mesenteric artery. So, the artery of midgut is superior mesenteric artery. Now, the superior mesenteric artery, we have already mentioned that it is running towards the apex of the loop of the midgut through the mesentery from the posterior aspect and that is how it is dividing the midgut loop into a proximal segment and the distal segment. Now, let us see what about the blood supply to the hindgut. The hindgut is actually supplied by the inferior mesenteric artery, so the third major artery arising from the abdominal aorta, that is the inferior mesenteric artery. So this is actually supplying the remaining portion that is from the junction of the right two-third and left one-third of the transverse column. So from this point onwards that means uh, the lateral one-third or the left one-third of the transverse column, then you have the descending column, then you have the sigmoid column, then the rectum, the anal canal. So all these are derived, I mean supplied by the inferior mesenteric artery. Now let us see how this rotation happens because in the beginning it was just a straight tube, now it is getting coiled then it is going back to its adult position. So how this happens we need to know. So in the initial period as a first step the midgut is actually forming a loop. This loop elongates ventrally and this is somewhat a U shaped loop. And this is not a, this is, this could not be accommodated in the abdominal cavity because the other organs are also developing. So at this moment what happens is this loop will herniate through the umbilicus and it will lie outside the abdominal cavity till a particular period so that the rest of the structures are developed simultaneously. So this loop actually projects into the proximal part of the umbilical cord. So this process of herniation which is meant for the good of the fetus, it is not a pathological herniation. So this is known as the physiological umbilical hernia. Now what happens then? The midgut lobe is actually divided into two parts by the superior mesenteric artery as we have discussed earlier, the proximal or the pre-arterial segment. This is the axis of the superior mesenteric artery. So this part is known as the pre-arterial segment and this region is known as the post-arterial segment. This is proximal and distal. Now let us see the rotation of the gut. So this is the first stage. In this stage, this is actually just a ventral loop which is coming out through the umbilical opening and this is actually lying in a vertical plane. Now what happens is it undergoes a 90 degree rotation in the anti-clockwise direction anti-clockwise direction the vertical limb actually becomes horizontal. It is actually in the anti-clockwise direction. So you just uh, see the points marked A and B. The A is actually on the pre-arterial segment and B is actually on the post-arterial segment. Now let us see what is going to happen. When it rotates anti-clockwise the pre-arterial segment is actually rotating to the 
right and the post arterial segment will be rotating to the left so that the vertical limb will become horizontal that is what is happening. So what are the structures derived from the pre arterial segment? You have the distal duodenum, the coils of jejunum and ileum. So these are the parts which are belonging to the pre arterial segment. So you just see the axis, this was the first axis, this just became horizontal and this entire loop is lying outside the abdominal cavity. So this point, the pre arterial segment will be now lying to the right and the post arterial segment will be now lying to the left. So the structures derived from this pre arterial segment is how, uh, what is mentioned here. That is the distal part of duodenum, the coils of jejunum and ileum. Now it is not complete yet. Then what happens is another anticlockwise direction in another rotation happens in the anticlockwise direction and this time it is 180 degree rotation. So let us see this was the first thing then it is almost horizontal by rotating at 90 degree. Now it is again rotating and finally it will be like this. So you just concentrate on this point A. This is up in the upper portion in the beginning it became a horizontal then it comes to the lower portion and it is now lying at the left part of the uh, abdominal cavity. So what happens if it is coming back to its original position it will be roughly 360 degree but the last 90 degree it is not rotating. So up to this point you will get a total of 270 degree rotation. So as it comes to this point it will start re-entering into the abdominal cavity. So as it do like this, the segment is actually passing behind the superior mesenteric artery. So this is a superior mesenteric artery. It is actually rotating on the axis of superior mesenteric artery and you can see that when it goes below, it is actually trying to go under the superior mesenteric artery and it will now lie. Uh, on the left side by passing under the superior mesenteric artery and the rotation, the total rotation completed is 270 degree. Now what happens to the post arterial segment? In the post arterial segment you can see a cecal diverticulum developing and this cecal diverticulum will be actually or the cecal bud will be actually giving rise to the cecum and appendix. The remaining part of the post arterial segment will be the lower part of the ileum, then the ascending colon, the proximal two third of the transverse colon. So these are the segments or the divisions of the post arterial segment. Now what happens is all these structures will be getting back into the abdominal cavity. So the herniated loop returns to the abdominal cavity by roughly 10th to 11th week of intrauterine period and the transverse colon will be now lying anterior to the superior mesenteric artery and the cecum will be lying on its right side. So previously the post arterial segment was below then it became left then it will go above and finally the adult position the cecum will be lying on the right side and the transverse colon will be actually lying anterior this is a superior mesenteric artery so the transverse colon will be lying anterior to the superior mesenteric artery. Now we have to discuss a point known as or a caption known as fixation of cut. So what do you mean by fixation of cut? So before you uh, have to understand the details about the fixation of cut you need to know how this gut is actually suspended within the body cavity. So that is by a tissue known as common mesentery. So the common mesentery will be actually suspending the entire organs within the body cavity. Now later what happens is some of the structures will be becoming retroperitoneal. Retroperitoneal means the structures will be lying behind the peritoneum. So how does this happen because in the initial period we have already said that all these structures are just suspended by the mesentery then how come some of the structures become retroperitoneal that is they will be actually uh, going towards the posterior aspect and lying on the posterior abdominal wall and it will be just covered by the peritoneum it won't be suspended by the peritoneum how does this happen 
This is actually happening by a process known as fusion of the mesentries. So, by the fusion of mesentries, which are the structures which are becoming retroperitoneal. So, previously in the beginning stage all these were suspended with the mesentery, but later some of the structures will go to the posterior aspect and they will be no longer suspended by the mesentery and they will be just covered on one aspect of the structures by the peritoneum. So, which are the structures which became retroperitoneal? They are the, fir the first one will be the duodenum except for the few centimeters in the proximal aspect because uh, the structure that is derived from the foregut will be still suspended by the mesentery. So, the remaining part of the duodenum will be actually moving towards the posterior aspect and the mesentery will be actually getting fused to the posterior abdominal wall and they will be uh, retroperitoneal in course of time. Then the same thing happens for the ascending colon, the descending colon and the rectum. So, all these structures will be moving towards the posterior aspect, they will be losing their mesentery by the fusion and they will become retroperitoneal. So, the original mesentery, so the entire thing which is shown in orange color that is actually the mesentery. So, this is actually uh, the mesentery after the child is born or how will it look like uh, once the child is born. So, in the previous stage the entire thing dorsally and ventrally you have mesentery suspending the entire organs within the body cavity, but later on according to its function some of the mesenteries will be fusing with the posterior abdominal wall and some of the structures will be becoming retroperitoneal that is what we have already seen. Now, uh, some of the organs will still have the mesentery. So, let us see where, which at which all regions you have the original mesentery persisting. So, where all we you will get the original mesentery? This is actually the small intestine, right? So, up to this point you have the small intestinal portion. So, the small intestine will be suspended by the mesentery. So, you call it as the mesentery of jejunum and mesentery of ileum. Similarly, the transverse colon will be again suspended by the mesentery, but here the mesentery is renamed as transverse mesocolon. Likewise, the sigmoid colon will also be suspended by the mesentery and this mesentery is known as sigmoid mesocolon. Now, uh, the double layer of peritoneum will be actually suspending all these gut tubes and this will be suspended from the dorsal aspect as well as the ventral aspect, we have already mentioned it. And uh, we will have a check about the blood vessels, how these blood vessels are reaching these organs. So, it is through the mesentery, the blood vessels and lymphatics uh, are able to reach these organs because all these blood vessels and lymphatics need some tissue to move through. So, that is possible with the help of mesentery. So, the, it is through the mesentery you have the blood vessels and lymphatics carried to its destination. Now, the organs covered by peritoneum you call it as intraperitoneal and the organs which lie against the posterior abdominal wall and which are just covered on one aspect of it you call it as retroperitoneal. So, intraperitoneal does not mean that you are keeping the organs within the peritoneal cavity. We have already mentioned the pericardial cavity, pleural cavity, peritoneal cavity. So, heart is not inside the pericardial cavity, lung is not inside the pleural cavity and the abdominal organs are not inside the peritoneal cavity. The concept when we say intraperitoneal means the entire organ is having peritoneum related, it is not within the cavity. Where, whereas, the retroperitoneal means the structures are going or moving towards the posterior abdominal wall so that one aspect of the organ is not having any peritoneal relation. The peritoneum is actually covering on the other aspect. So, only one surface of the organ will be related to peritoneum. Such structures are called as retroperitoneal because it will be seen as if the structures are lying behind the peritoneum. So, the lower end of the esophagus up to the cloacal region uh, it is suspended from the posterior abdominal wall by a mesentery and this mesentery is known as dorsal mesentery. So, the dorsal mesentery in the stomach region you call it as dorsal mesogastrium or greater omentum. So, this is uh, the adult derivative of dorsal mesentery. So, the dorsal mesentery which is suspending the lower end of the uh, esophagus along with the greater curvature of the stomach, this is known as greater omentum.
Similarly, the duodenum, the initial segment will also be getting a derivative from the dorsal mesentery that is known as dorsal mesoduodenum. And the jejunum and ileum we have already mentioned that uh, it is still suspended by the mesentery and that is actually the mesentery proper. And in the colon you call it as dorsal mesocolon. So, all these are derivatives of the dorsal mesentery. So, dorsal mesentery is nothing but the folds of peritoneum which are suspending all these structures from the posterior abdominal wall. Now, so this is the dorsal mesocolon. So, dorsal mesogastrium, dorsal mesoduodenum, the mesentery proper for the jejunum and ileum and the dorsal mesocolon. So, when we have a look at the dorsal mesentery, we know that the mesentery the term is actually, uh, we call mesentery the term only for the jejunum and ileum after birth. All the rest of the parts which are suspended by the dorsal mesentery, it is actually renamed as dorsal mesogastrium or great tromentum, dorsal mesoduodenum, dorsal mesocolon. But in the region of jejunum and ileum, the dorsal mesentery is actually known as mesentery itself. Now coming to the ventral mesentery, ventral mesentery means the structure is uh, actually suspended from the anterior abdominal wall by the peritoneum. So, the peritoneum which suspends the structures from the anterior abdominal wall that is known as ventral mesentery. So, the ventral mesentery will be there for the terminal part of the esophagus, uh, for the stomach and uh, also for the upper part of duodenum. So, the remaining regions actually will just degenerate only it will be seen in this region that is the terminal part of the esophagus, the stomach and the upper part of duodenum. So, this is actually the ventral mesentery. Now, in the ventral mesentery, you have the liver developing. So, when the liver comes in between, you have the ventral mesentery divided into two segments. So, uh, the ventral mesentery is actually a derivative of septum transversum and with the development of the liver, the ventral mesentery is actually divided into two segments. So, which are the two segments? You have the lesser omentum, can you see? It is actually the ventral mesentery extending from the lesser curvature till the liver. So, this part extending between the lesser curvature of the stomach till the liver, you call it as lesser omentum and this is actually extending down up to the upper part of the duodenum. Similarly, anterior to the liver, you have the falciform ligament. So, what is falciform ligament? It is again a derivative of ventral mesentery and this extends from the liver to the anterior abdominal wall or the ventral body wall. So, the ventral mesentery is actually getting divided into lesser omentum and falciform ligament with the development of the liver in the ventral mesentery. Now, the development of body cavities, this will be dealt in detail in uh, the development which is happening for the embryo, but here for completion sake I will just mention you have small cleft like spaces which are developing in the lateral plate mesoderm and they coalesce to form the U shaped large cavity that is known as the intra embryonic coelom. This intra embryonic coelom actually splits the intra embryonic mesoderm that especially the lateral plate mesoderm into two. The one is known as the somatopleuric which will be lying closer to the ectoderm. Somato means concerned with the body wall. And the other layer which is in connection with the yolk sac or the endoderm, you call it as planchnopleuric. So, the intraembryonic coelom is actually dividing the lateral plate mesoderm into somatopleuric layer and the splanchnopleuric layer. So, this is how the entire coelom will be looking like. So, at the cranial end you have the pericardial cavity, in the middle you have the pleural cavities and it, towards the caudal end you have the peritoneal cavities. So, in the initial period, all these cavities are in communication and it was just a U-shaped loop. But later what happens is you can see that it is divided into closed sacs. So, this is the pericardial cavity, this is a pleural cavity and this is a peritoneal cavity. So, how this canal is divided into closed sacs? That is actually by the formation of membranes. So, this is known as the pleuropericardial membrane, this is known as the pleuroperitoneal membrane. So, these two membranes will be actually separating the pericardial cavity from pleural cavity and the pleural cavity from peritoneal cavity.
So, uh, we know that after birth we have only one single peritoneal cavity. But here when we look we can see that there are two peritoneal cavities. So, what happens is these two cavities will be fusing together when the embryo undergoes lateral folding and ultimately it will result in the formation of a single peritoneal cavity. And here you have the lungs in the thoracic region that will be invaginating into the pleural cavity and you have the heart which is invaginating into the pericardial cavity. So, the pericardial cavity is actually a derivative of the intraembryonic coelom cranial to the precordial plate. So, at the time of craniocaudal folding, cephalocaudal folding what happens is the pericardial cavity will be coming to the ventral aspect that is its adult position or else what will happen? You have the oral cavity here in the embryonic disc the pericardial cavity was actually cephalic to the oral cavity. So, you will be born with a heart at the region cephalic to the oral cavity. So, uh, this will undergo a cephalocaudal folding so that the pericardial cavity will come from the cephalic region and it will lie in the adult position. Now, what are the derivatives? The parietal layer of the serous and the fibrous pericardium, they are actually derived from the somatopleuric mesoderm whereas the lyseral layer of the pericardial cavity is derived from the splanchnopleuric mesoderm. Now, about the pleural cavity that is the second cavity. The lung buds, you can see the lung buds from the foregut, they are actually invaginating into the pericardio peritoneal canal that they are actually forming the pleural cavities. Now, you can see the lung bud that is invaginating into the peri pericardio peritoneal canal uh, and that will be actually covering the lung as the pleural cavity. The canals will be uh, later replaced by the pericardio pleural membrane and the pleuroperitoneal membrane. So, these membranes will be actually separating the pleural cavity from the pericardial cavity as well as the peritoneal cavity. So, again you have to remember that the lung is just invaginating into the cavity and it is not going and lying inside the cavity. So, the lung is not within the pleural cavity, but the pleural cavity is just covering the lung. The entire pleural cavity is just covering the lung, but the lung is not going and lying inside the pleural cavity that thing you have to keep in mind. Now, the perit peritoneal cavity you have already mentioned in the beginning they were just two separate cavities, but after folding they will get fused together to form a single peritoneal cavity. At this moment uh, you should know how the diaphragm is derived. So, the diaphragm is derived from many sources, it is not just a single source giving rise to the development of diaphragm. So, what are the sources from which the diaphragm is derived? First one is the septum transversum, this is said to be the chief source, then you have the pleuroperitoneal membranes, then you have the dorsal esophageal mesentery or otherwise known as mesoesophagus and towards the uh, periphery you have the body wall. So, all these structures are giving rise to the formation of diaphragm. Now, let us discuss some of the clinical aspects. When the anterior body wall does not form properly, what happens is some of the structures will be lying outside the abdominal cavity when the baby is born. So, one such condition, one such defect of the anterior abdominal wall will result in a condition known as gastroschisis. What do you mean by gastroschisis? In this condition, the abdominal viscera will be lying outside usually or prefer preferably on the right side of the umbilicus. So, that is what is meant by gastroschisis. The abdominal viscera will be lying outside usually on the right side of the umbilicus. So, you can see the umbilicus here and you can see the coils of intestine lying outside the abdominal cavity and usually on the right side. This was our opening case that is known as omphilocele. Here, you are not able to visualize the gut tubes because they are covered by a membrane. So, here the membrane is the amnion. So, the gut tubes are actually lying outside the abdominal cavity, but they are not just shattered, they are just covered by the membrane that is the amnion. So, this condition is usually associated with cardiac and neural tube defects and in this condition you will also get elevated alpha fetoprotein level. The chromosomal abnormalities are also seen associated with this condition. We have mentioned about the diaphragm, the uh, the, how the diaphragm is derived, the sources of development. Now, at times some of the regions might be missing. 
in during the course of development when you look at the diaphragm some of the regions will be having some defects. So, through this defects what happens? that is actually the diaphragm is actually separating the thoracic cavity from the abdominal cavity. So, if there is any defect in the diaphragm what happens is the contents of the abdominal cavity will be just uh, passing through this def these defects and it will be reaching the thoracic cavity. So, this is uh, what is seen here you can see this is the abdominal cavity the coils are actually pushing through the defect in the diaphragm and reaching the thoracic cavity. So, you can see this is the lung and this is the lung on this side. So, this lung is actually compressed because of the structures from the abdomen reaching the thoracic cavity. So, this is actually uh, known as the congenital diaphragmatic hernia. Why is it called congenital? Because as the baby is born the defect will be there that is known as congenital diaphragmatic hernia and this is a very serious defect and you have to intervene as early as possible. And the main pathology behind is the failure of fusion of the pleuroperitoneal membrane. Pleuroperitoneal membrane was a membrane which was separating the pleural cavity from the peritoneal cavity. So, if that separation is not there or if, the, if that part is not getting fused with the remaining part of the diaphragm, what happens is there will be a defect in that region. So, through this defect the abdominal contents will be herniating into the thoracic region. So, ultimately what happens the pleural cavity and peritoneal cavity will be communicate, communicating. So, the abdominal viscera will be herniating into the pleural cavity through this defect. It is usually most common on the left side and in this condition what happens is the lung is not able to expand because the most of the region in the thoracic cavity is occupied by the uh, contents from the abdominal cavity. So, our poor lung is not able to expand on its own and that will ultimately result in pulmonary hypoplasia. So, the congenital diaphragmatic hernia means the herniation of the abdominal contents through defects in the uh, different parts of the diaphragm. So, which are the commonest points where you can get the defects? The first one is known as Bogdalek hernia. Bogdalek hernia is the most common variety and this is actually seen posterolaterally. The failure of closure of the diaphragm in the posterolateral aspect which will, will result in Bogdalek hernia. Another variety is known as Mogagni hernia. So, you can see the defect in the anterior aspect of the diaphragm that is known as the Mogagni hernia and this is said to be the rarest of the congenital hernias. Uh, so, in this session we have discussed about the formation of the primitive gut tube that is actually the absorbed portion of the yolk sac into the embryonic disc. We have discussed about uh, the derivatives of the foregut, the derivatives of midgut, the derivatives of hindgut. Now, which all arteries from the abdominal aorta are supplying the foregut, midgut, hindgut that is the foregut is supplied by the celiac artery, midgut by the superior mesenteric artery, the hindgut by the inferior mesenteric artery. Then we discussed about the rotation because in the beginning the gut tube was a single tube which was lying vertically then it undergoes looping then for a particular period of time it just lies outside the abdominal cavity so that there is uh, space for the other organs to develop within the abdominal cavity and once these structures are getting uh, modified and uh, they will be going back to its original position by a process known as rotation of gut and once it is inside the gut some of the mesenteries will go off so that the structures will be seated in its adult position and that process is known as fixation of gut. So, by the fixation of gut some of the structures will lose its mesentery and some will have the mesentery as it is uh, in the beginning and uh, the development of mesenteries, the derivatives of mesenteries we have mentioned. Later we discussed about the body cavities, the different cavities which we get throughout the body that is the pericardial cavity, pleural cavity and peritoneal cavity and we also discussed about some of the applied aspects. So, this is all about the development of the gut tubes in a nutshell. Thank you.